Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, again, if you're watching on live stream or if you want to participate on Twitter, please use the hashtag, hashtag TTIP. Um, now we're going to move into kind of the business panel discussion around this, and we have four panelists with, with us today. Um, each of them will just make a short statement of about two minutes each to introduce some of the topics, and then we'll move very quickly into the question section. So I'm going to introduce them all at once. And if you raise your hand so they know who I'm talking about when you say it, there's uh, Peter Keegan. He's president of the American Chamber of Commerce Ireland. Erica Mann, <coughs> head of global policy, public policy, Facebook Europe. Uh, Paul O'Hara, director, Ashoka Europe, and founder of Change Nation, and Connor Murphy, founder and CEO of Data Hug. So um, I'd like to start with Peter, if you don't mind, just give us kind of two minutes of your thoughts on what this could potentially mean for business. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Well, I think um, as president of the US Chamber of Commerce in Ireland, uh, first I should say I'm glad, even though we shortened it and talk about this as a trade agreement, I'm particularly happy it's called TTIP because the I in TTIP, uh, the investment piece, is something that we're particularly interested in. The uh, you know, US, there are 700 US companies operating in Ireland, counting for 26% of Ireland's GDP. So for us, broadly, anything that removes impediments, removes inefficiencies, uh, that promotes investment in Ireland in the transatlantic trade relationship uh, is certainly to be welcomed. Um, so I kind of feel myself, too, sitting on both sides of the last panel because uh, in my day job, I'm the country head for Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in Ireland. So as a, as a European working in a U.S. bank uh, in Europe, uh, we are subject to regulations that are set in the U.S. that, that apply to the group globally. Uh, operating in Europe, we're subject to regulations that uh, the European Union produce. So I see, and, and I understand what Michael Leary talks about, Everybody agrees uh, that there's, there's a good opportunity for this agreement. Uh, there is hunger, hunger for investment and jobs in the US and in Europe. We're now getting to the stage where we're going to be presented with the menu, the menu of compromises and changes that are going to be needed to, to say that, uh, and that is going to be the challenge. We see this every day in our, in our day jobs. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a real example, we offer credit cards in the US and in, and in Europe. Uh, in the US, the regulator will come and say, 90 days in arrears, charge it off, you know, write off that debt, which impairs the customer's credit history. In Europe, the same regulatory objectives, but the regulator will come along and say, treat the customer fairly, work with him, you know, spend as much as you need to do to try and work it out and, and repair. So, you know, when it comes to, I think regulation is going to be one of the really big challenges. Um, the regulatory regimes are very different. The regulatory objectives are very consistent. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of vested interests in, um, uh, in both sides. And so I think trying to persuade uh, people to change, to compromise, is going to be a real challenge to success. Uh, so we absolutely want this agreement to work, but we don't underestimate the challenges to making it successful. Thank you very much. That's great. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, now, um, Erica Mann, if you could uh, just let us know what you think. Um, I think for um, all internet companies, uh, um, it's a highly interesting concept to have an integrated market between Europe and the United States, which is already reality now. And when you look where the main drivers are coming from, um, it is um, very much from, the, from Europe and from the United States. Of course, there, uh, when you look in the mobile sector, um, there are different players from other parts of the world um, as well. So the integration, uh, further integration, of what already exists and to make it more efficient and uh, will be ex accept, uh, exceptionally important uh, for us. Uh, we are in a very early phase of evaluating. Now, I had a history of 15 years being a member of the European Parliament and covering trade. Um, so I do understand the concept pretty well, but it's still something one has to look into how much what it really means for companies which are part of the internet ecosystem because we understand very well the traditional sectors we do understand very well uh, the first phase of the, uh, what is part of the overall internet economy, but these very young uh, industries like ours uh, on social media, I think it is something we will have to analyze and we will have to understand the importance and we need probably much more data. Uh, but what one can already say now is that the regulatory side will be extremely important because we are, we, our oversight, because we have our headquarter in, uh, our international headquarter in Dublin and 
We have our uh, US and for, for Canada headquarters uh, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, we are oversight by the FTC and oversight by the Irish um, data privacy auditor, for example. So for us, it's very important, uh, and as much as one can align the systems, not make them identical, because we have different histories and we have different tradition and how regulation is done and how standards are developed, but if you can align them, if you can make them more coherent, if there's less disruptions, if we can avoid the emergence of what we call uh, uh, non-tariff trade barriers, uh, which make it very hard for business and even more so for smaller companies, um, then I think we will reach a lot. And that's one thing I think we should not forget. Uh, the, the companies and the internet com um, environment, they are from the very first moment, at least I would probably say 80, 90% global. So whatever we do, we have to respect the global environment. Um, and uh, this maybe it's a challenge as well because sometimes these kind of agreements tend to um, become too much, you know, two-sided. So Europe and uh, the United States only. I think we have to respect that um, in many of the business uh, are global companies and so that the rules which evolve and the regulation which evolve must respect us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul O'Hara, what do you think? About the, this about partnership. the possibility of this, I mean, is it, is it all just talk? Is it really a very nice thing? Uh, sure, they've been talking about it for 20 years. What makes them think it's going to happen now? Or do you think that this is a real opportunity for business? Yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know much about the history of it, so I don't know um, where it's coming from. But certainly, it seemed to be a fair bit of commitment on the US side from this morning's panel. That was definitely encouraging. Um, the fact that there's almost, al already a number of agreements in place suggests that it's already been proven to happen, so it seems like it's definitely doable. Um, you know, I was just thinking if there's 15 million jobs already in the mix, you know, if they can get another 10 or 20 percent out of that with this deal, um, that's going to be very helpful. There's 27 million people unemployed in Europe today. I don't know what the number is in the US, um, but I know it's high. And so, so I think from a job creation uh, perspective, it makes it an, an imperative. And certainly that kind of trade link between the US and Europe seems like one of those sweet opportunities because both are so, um, uh, so dependent on job creation right now that it seems like it is in that sweet spot. Um, and I just know from personal experience, you know, things like regulation and uh, cross-border investment and that kind of thing could definitely be made easier so that uh, whether it's companies or citizen sector organizations or whatever can just move more freely um, between, uh, you know, what is increasingly becoming one market, honestly. You know, um, I'm in the U.S. pretty much every month now, and uh, it just, you know, I don't see a distinction between going to the U.S. or going to mainland Europe. And uh, Connor Murphy, um, I'd be interested in your perspective as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, this is a, there are a lot of multinationals and everything talking about this. But I mean, what does it mean for you know small businesses, if anything? Yeah, until this morning, I, I wasn't aware there was a problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, um, like our story, like we came back literally three years ago from Washington D.C., probably in the same plane with the IMF, and we've since created 25 jobs. So. I've had no issues with trade. It's more like where we find customers. We're an online digital company. Any company in the world in a matter of seconds can access our product and start paying for it. Uh, the biggest issue is probably for me at a micro level are probably the flights which have been touched upon. Um, but then the other two areas of investment and people, I think they're the two key, key areas that I always focus on. And we've raised over five and a half million dollars in the last three years. And being based here in Ireland and in Europe hasn't been an issue for the US investors. So I very much see it as one market. I'm in the US an awful lot. Um, I haven't encountered any problems yet, so maybe that's an in indication of our failure to not having grown big enough yet to hit the regulators or to hit the issues. Um, but the other side is people and attracting talent. Um, it's been super easy for us to attract people from Canada, from New York, from the UK to come and move to Ireland. Um, and particularly, I know I went the other way, I lived in the States for four years, and you're know, going through the visa process there. In a matter of three weeks with no lawyers, we were able to get um, one of our senior developers visa here, uh, no problem. So we've actually had no regulatory issues. We've had no uh, complexity issues. Um, our whole market probably is global, but probably in Q1 this year, I'd say 75% of our business came from the US. I see it as one market in my head, uh, but I'm probably just naive and haven't gone through enough pain yet. 
Um, good. And, uh, Naive is good. And sadly, on the optimistic side of things. And on the flip side, on the regulatory side, pri privacy is a really big one for us. Um, we do a lot of work in the privacy space, and actually, it's a competitive advantage for us. We go into the US, and we've come from the EU, and they're like, oh my god, privacy is a nightmare in the EU, and they're scared, uh, terrified maybe of, the, of it. But because we've come up in, in, in Ireland and we're based here, we have to go through more privacy regulation, we have to go through probably more privacy um, effort on our side, which actually gives us a competitive advantage when we go to the US, because they're like, oh, you're a European company, you guys know privacy. Um, mm -hmm. um, teach us what we need to do, and actually it gives us a competitive advantage in the marketplace. So um, it wasn't a joy reading work in paper 55 in privacy in the European Union, but now that we understand it, it's actually an advantage to us. So that's the only regulation that really affects us, and it affects us positively. Great. Okay. I'd like to open it up to the audience now, please. Um, I have a gentleman here. If we have the microphone. Microphones going around. If you could just stand up so they can see you. Thanks. Hi, good morning. My name is Morris Ryan. I'm um, with Greenbelt Limited, which is Ireland's private, largest private forestry company. And I um, just want to make a couple of points about the um, potential for forestry within Ireland and, and um, across the Atlantic, basically. Um, and this is to yourself, Peter, I think, the um, Chamber of Commerce. Potential for American companies or American individuals investing into Irish forestry and creating jobs as every euro or every dollar that's spent should be seen to try and create future jobs or further jobs. Um, we obviously here on the, with our finger on the pulse of it can see the benefit of that, but we also like to see, is there one, is there an appetite from the US to invest into alternative investments such as forestry, and will they look at going into Europe or Ireland in particular? And obviously then there's potential for the Irish in Europe to invest into the, into the States. And Paul, just a little something on to your side of things, from the forestry side of things with the sort of social entrepreneurship, is it something that you've considered or have you encountered? And again, I'm just gauging the appetite that might be out there in the marketplace. So it's a mouthful for you both there, so if you can. If I, um, I'll first answer the question about the, uh, the appetite for US investment into forestry. I think um, in my experience, there's an appetite in the US to invest in pretty much anything, um, if it makes sense and if it, if it will give a, an economic return. Um, and some fact of what you're touching on gets into a, a market that's, that we can learn from the US and where I hope TTIP helps break down boundaries is on this whole uh, area of non-bank finance, which means going directly to investors, not going through banks. Um, in the US, there's something like 30% of corporate funding um, comes from banks. In Europe, it's like 70%. So there's this huge capital market, um, private equity market, uh, in the US that operates very efficiently that doesn't operate in Europe. Uh, the European uh, policymakers and regulators see a real need for that to be created because there's a huge drive in Europe to delever banks, to make banks less risky. Um, there has to be another means of getting deposits which are out there and cash that is out there, um, uh, having getting business access to that. So products like yours are firmly going to form part of that. Where there are some barriers to that right now, are some of the uh, regulations around, um, around um, secured finance, around securitization. Um, European regulations are prohibiting some potential investors like insurance funds uh, in Europe or across the world from investing in what they deem to be uh, products that are too risky. Uh, a, lot of the quant a lot of the metrics behind it would say they're, they're far from being too risky. So I think there is, again, you know, necessity will be the mother of invention. There is going to be a need to create greater access from European uh, you know, entrepreneurs, European corporates, to get access to finance without having to go through banks. And I think you'll find there's a huge drive over the next few years to make that more accessible. Um, and one of the ways you've got to start is by making sure that regulation, uh, banking regulation particularly, does not prohibit some potential investors from getting into your space. Thank you. Um, Paul, did you want to answer on the social entrepreneurship side? Sure, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's a sector I'm not terribly familiar with. I know that we've backed a number of social entrepreneurs in the likes of Latin America um, that are working really to pr preserve uh, forests and kind of natural ecosystems. Um, basically, from a, from a social entrepreneurship perspective, we're interested. If government aren't doing it and the market aren't interested yet, um, I think go the social entrepreneur's role in that space is probably going to be in the kind of protection space, but also in maybe identifying new markets that haven't been realized yet by the private sector and playing that kind of intervening role for a period. So 
I mean, from an environmental perspective, extremely interested in the forestry space, and you know, it all depends on the particular idea of whether we'd invest in it or not. Thank you. More questions from the audience, maybe from this side of the room? Anyone? You're very quiet today. Yes, you not had enough there. coffee? Sure, there's plenty back there. There's one gentleman. Somebody over here? I saw a hand there. Did you see a hand I there? Saw a hand there so there's one over there. Sorry, just behind you. Woman in the white scar. White scar. Deirdre Johnston, Canton 2013, Forum, County Kerry. Um, I would love some reassurance, and maybe I'm not quite directing this question at any one person on the panel, but everybody on the panel. Policymakers are taking the lead here, as they should, but how um, intrinsic is the entrepreneur, the business leaders, the Michael O'Leary type voice in this negotiation? And can we be reassured that that voice will be heard throughout the negotiations? Does I don't think Michael O'Leary's voice isn't going to be heard, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I love hearing it. Um, I, I, I think actually, you know, policymakers in, in this field are used to work very much, you know, intensively with the business community. Um, and it tends to be done sector by sector because sectors have very different concerns and different barriers which exist, which they love to see being removed in, in this free trade agreement. So I, I, would, I think this is going to happen. There, there are some concerns um, I'm sorry, which I raised for, for our industry because it is so young and we do not have all the data and the integration factors between um, the two economies. So there needs to be some work done which will be still quite fresh. Um, but on the other side, it's very familiar terrain for legislators. Um, so I'm not so much worried about this actually what I would recommend to do, nonetheless, for the, for the business community, really to ask that there will be constant working groups and uh, where this can be discussed and where they can be part, um, of, you know, not part of the negotiations, but the, where they can contribute um, to, the, to the discussions. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, EU, yes, integrated or in parallel, but this is something we clearly, um, the business community should ask for and uh, this should be supported. Um, Erica, your experience working in Europe, I mean, the, the trend there, I think she's right, is that you know, they, policy makers go off, they make a decision, and then they impose it on the business community, and there's very little consultation. Um, so it's really designed from a policy point of view as opposed to the practicalities of, of, of business. So are you hopeful, though, that this might be something different, or is it really up to the business community to say, that's fine, you're gonna negotiate this, but hey, you need to talk to us. No, that's what I meant. Um, I think the business community must, be, must really ask for it and must be part of the discussions. Uh, but don't forget, in the trade world, this is common ground. So because um, you, know, you can't make a trade uh, arrangement and a trade deal without having the understanding and the knowledge which comes from the business community because you have to deal with facts. So um, it is a little bit more troublesome sometimes in when it comes to the standard setting and the regulatory environment. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I am hopeful it's manageable. But nonetheless, I would urge the business community to get involved uh, and as early as possible, because otherwise it, it can happen in certain sectors, certain areas, um, the business community may be overlooked. And um, just Peter, to you on that, and then I'm gonna go back to the audience. I mean, in general, the worst thing you can do for the business community is give them more red tape. The thing with the business community, you just wanna get out of their way and let them do their thing. Is there a fear among your members that this is just going to add to their regulatory and red tape burdens? Uh, yes, there is, uh, I think that's fair. I think, uh, I mean, was I very happy to hear Ambassador Froman say that, um, you know, that, that every day, I think it's the National Security Council, what are you doing for jobs and growth? I wish that question was asked more in more forums. You know, I wish in the, in the FDA, in, the, in some of the other uh, standard and regulatory bodies, you know, how does, your, how does this raft of regulations um, impact the consumer? You know, what does it do for access to medicines uh, for patients? What does it do to the cost to the consumer of receiving this product? Um, Certainly, people seem a real, there is a frustration. Um, e even the gap between policy makers who make policy statements, which generally we all agree, but about jobs and growth, and people who actually write and implement uh, regulations. And, and sometimes there seems to be a lot of loss in translation in the middle there. Mm -hmm. 
So I think um, a more, uh, more business-like attitude and really people, I think I would like to see people who write rules um, talk more about outcomes and impact. And I think it's true. Industry bodies like ours, um, you know, that we've got to keep reinforcing, sending the message back up. Uh, you may have had a good, uh, you know, we may agree with your policy objective, but how you intend this implementation is going to hurt and is only going to add red tape, it's going to add cost or whatever. But it, it is up to the business community to keep re that re reinforcing that feedback loop. Um, and again, that's what people like the Chamber try and do. And often in, in politics, business is treated as kind of one unit and that all the solutions to the problems would be the same. So uh, some of the things that have been expressed in terms of the fears are that they're trying to treat the pharmaceutical industry the same as the agriculture industry, which are very different, very different standards, very different needs. So is that also something that you think that each industry body needs to go in and lobby hard with in these negotiations and say, look, you can't say to us that we have to do the same thing in ag agriculture that they do in the pharmaceutical sector. I think I heard from uh, Mike Froman yesterday that they don't expect TTIP to go in and, and into each regulatory authority and write the rules for them. But there is an opportunity for TTIP uh, to set principles around regulatory cooperation um, and around um, convergence of regulation. So I think that's a start. Um, because at least I think then that gives different regulatory bodies a framework in which to set regulations. Uh, you know, over the last few years, it, you know, while the global economy has created a huge need for jobs and growth, the regulatory reaction is often quite nationalistic. Um, and there is a disconnect there between how regulatory bodies behave um, and the needs of the global economy. So I think they, you know, again, you, we hear at the top of the house, the right thing's been said, the right objective's been set, uh, but they have to follow through and say, set the right principles, even if they're not going to rewrite each individual rule, which I don't think anybody expects them to, uh, but they've got to set a framework under which regulation should operate. Thank you. Okay, audience. <laughs> I have a question, sorry. I'm just asking the panel, feel free to answer. While the negotiations will happen government to government, how are you strategizing in your organizations or various working groups to bring on board some of the other member states that might not share the same opinion about free trade that Ireland has, which is very pro, very job creation, has a very forward-leaning attitude. What about those where um, there's a little bit more skepticism and there are other uh, organizations lobbying governments on the other side? I'd, I'd be curious to know your strategies on engaging with your counterparts or colleagues in those countries. While it is a government-to-government -government discussion, there are, as, as um, was pointed out by Mr. Keegan, the national thoughts on certain regulatory issues. Thanks. Does anybody want to take that? Well, I think I'll just start by saying um, the American Chamber in Ireland has got together with, Amer with the Chamber's EU, um, and so a lot of what we're seeing here today is pretty much reflective of what the uh, American Chambers right across the EU would say in other member countries. So we're trying to make sure that it's not just a unilateral uh, Ireland position, that we're connected right across Europe through the Chamber network. Um, now, lots of bodies like IBEC, there's Business Europe, so there's lots of uh, industry bodies that operate here in Ireland who have... Uh, umbrella bodies across Europe. So that's one way in trying to make sure that uh, we present a pan-European voice uh, from business and, uh, and the economies. Um, but it's absolutely true that's a counterbalance, uh, but that's how we try and address that. There, there were some um, objections raised yesterday by France, maybe not surprisingly, um, around audiovisual. So um, they're saying, well, we need to protect our culture and some of the things that we do in terms of trade do impact specifically on our culture. They're talking about film and television programs and, of course, their language. So France has always been seen as a country that mm, might not you know, be interested in this. But there might be cultural implications for Ireland and, and elsewhere. I mean, do you think that those can be overcome? Any of you who maybe have experience of working throughout Europe? My, my <laughs> feeling is that, you know, actually all countries, European member states countries, are very positive. Um, and don't forget, they have a history in a moment of negotiating bilateral free trade agreements. Um, I mean, the Korea agreement uh, is signed recently. Um, so there's a history of very negotiating very complex bilateral free trade agreements. It's true, and this will be the same um, between Europe and the United States, that some member states will have more reservations and wishes to protect certain industry, and this will depend what they call you know, their national interest. And this you know, differs from country to country based on the, the industry which is located uh, in their domestic area. 
but nonetheless, the wish is there to have this agreement, and then one will have to sort out a kind of package. Um, it, but ideally, some of the protections will be overcome, hopefully, and um, at least that's, I think, would be the ideal outcome. Yeah, I think the, the, the cultural concerns are probably well placed. I mean, uh, I don't know how people feel about the fact that mo most teenagers in Dublin sound like they're from California. <laughs> Um, yes, and they're not just my children, everybody's <laughs> children, yes. So, uh, so we've already been infected by US culture here, I would say. And, uh, you know, the French are notoriously um, paranoid, but also very proud of their culture, and I think they're entitled to that. Um, uh, but, you know, I think that should be outside of most of the trade uh, negotiations, certainly from a social innovation perspective. Um, I suppose the reason I was invited here was, you know, social innovation has never really been on the agenda of a trade agreement um, before, and nor is it necessarily on this one, but, um, but it is happening. Uh, there's more and more uh, solutions flowing from US into Europe. Um, we've imported uh, several into Ireland um, through Change Nation. Um, and, you know, some of them are job-creating ones, like Kiva, which is all around microfinance, um, Project Echo, which is about making the healthcare system more efficient. Um, and, but likewise, the social innovation spreading from, um, from Europe into the US. Um, and just a couple of examples, in Denmark, there's an innovation called Specialisterna. It's a consulting firm that employs only people with autism, outsources that talent to the software <coughs> industry. And, um, and it was developed in Copenhagen initially. The founders actually just moved to Maryland um, with a view to creating uh, significant numbers of jobs for uh, the autistic community in the US. And then you have a homegrown uh, success, Coder Dojo, which has mm -hmm. uh, many coding clubs, particularly on the West Coast, um, uh, probably one on Facebook, I suspect. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's a, a kind of a, another social innovation that's kind of cultivating the, the, the key skills of the 21st century. So the, this has never been kind of on the table before, but it already is happening. And it'd be great to kind of formalize the partnership a bit, whether it's through this agreement or through another forum. Uh, actually, culture is such an important thing, uh, weirdly, from a, from a tech perspective. Um, great talent can work anywhere they want in the world. Um, and we're lucky that Dublin, which is a village, in my view, in the west coast of Europe, um, if you look at the map, you wouldn't stop off here, probably, if you're trying to do business either side of the Atlantic. But, Culturally, like we put an ad up in America or Canada particularly to, put, to attract people to work in Ireland. We get about 50, 60 job applications. People in Google and Facebook and places in Silicon Valley are starving for talent. And talent goes where it's exciting, where it's fun, where it's interesting to go. And Dublin actually, we don't accept it probably here, is actually seen as exotic uh, from people from other parts of the world. And it's actually one of the best places in the world actually to live and actually from a quality of life perspective. A lot of our team love the fact they all walk to work, they all commute, you know, they've all lived in Australia, they've all lived all over the world, but as a place to actually work and do some really quality work, Dublin's a really good place. And culturally, it's very exciting as well. We, can, you know, we had six Canadian interns there recently, and just put the word Dublin in the job ad, and you just, the next sentence when you're talking to them, and these guys have worked at Google, Facebook, they're getting job offers from everywhere. They say, we're an hour from Barcelona, we're an hour from Paris. These small little things, so the French culture actually helps us uh, attracting talent because Europe is somewhere interesting to, to actually come and live and work. And uh, you know, that's how we can compete with Silicon Valley in one way, apart from the taxes and all of these other ways. But actually, Ireland is a place we want to work. And I think Noel Tulin, who's a brand ambassador for countries, talks about there's only 19 countries in the world that actually have a national brand and identity. And Europe actually has probably the bulk of them. So Europe's brand and culture around that is hugely, hugely exciting and advantageous from a tech point of view to attract talent. Thank you. Did you want to say something on that? Uh, no, I, I, I fully endorse those. And, and I think it's, that's that cultural aspect is hugely important for foreign direct investment as well because we know lots of projects that we see and we try and win here, we're not going to be able to staff every job and every skill set in Ireland. So uh, one of the points that we lobby on frequently is, <clears throat> is making sure that the package that is Ireland works as a place to attract in people. Uh, culture is hugely important, quality of life, the tax regime, you know, the, the personal tax regime. Uh, but it is important for us in these negotiations that uh, I think we have a lot to offer uh, making this agreement work broadly is, is, will be positive for Ireland, will uh, anything that removes barriers and impediments or inefficiencies uh, for US companies to go and, and invest in Europe 
good for Ireland, uh, and we also got to keep making sure that this package that Ireland offers, uh, which is absolutely about quality of life, place to work, fantastic weather when you're indoors. Um, you know, that, that, great, that, great coding uh, weather. Great coding weather. weather, yes, exactly. Yes, uh, uh, that, it, that, it, that it works. So. Um, some commentators say that this agreement is really just about the rise of China on the world scene and that the United States and the EU are just getting together because they need to compete um, against China. I mean, how do you feel about that? Do you think that that's a, a, a true concern or motivation? Uh, or as um, one of our speakers, Thomas Dunahoo, said earlier, is, look, it's just a big triangle between the three of us, and we need to, you know, if, if one of us is down, the other one's down, so that this will really help stimulate trade between all of those regions. What do you, what do you think? I think there, um, you know, I think generally people would say China advancing and developing is good for global trade. I think there are some opportunities in this treaty, uh, and I'm thinking particularly around um, IP protection. So there, I think it's fair to say that a lot of U.S. companies, uh, multinationals, um, operating in, in both the EU and Europe, uh, IP is their, is their biggest asset. They've invested millions in it. Uh, I think the EU, and your, uh, the EU and the U.S. share a fairly common set of values around the rights uh, you know, for patent protection, um, uh, for privacy, uh, for trade secrets. So I think we have an opportunity within the uh, disagreement that the EU and the US set a common set of standards around IP protection um, that, will, uh, that will then really be forced to be applied globally. So you know, I think that's an area that we have an opportunity um, in this treaty to set standards, um, and, it, and, and it helps export those standards to places where the same values are often shared. Um, and if people think that within the EU, uh, EU-US trade bloc, um, if you go and spend time and effort and money and have that fantastic idea um, that it's going to be protected, I think it becomes an attraction to innovators from around the world in, in other places where it's not so well protected to come into this trading bloc um, and develop and innovate because you know that your property will be protected. Uh, so you know, that, that's probably one aspect of, of, the, of the China, Asia, LATAM, uh, African uh, impact that I think uh, is positive out of this treaty. And Paul, did you want to say something about yeah, that? Yeah, so I, I mean, just my, my perspective on this is I think Europe has been stagnant pretty much for a decade. Um, I think the market share of the US and Europe, if it's 50% of GDP, that will continue to decline um, for decades to come. So mm -hmm. the share that the US and Europe are going to have is going to decline. So it is under attack um, if you want to look at it that way from India, China, Brazil, etc. But I actually think that that's where the biggest opportunities reside for Europe and US. Um, and I think the two coming together to pursue those opportunities is another opportunity. <laughs> um, but you know, if you think of, um, I was on a, a, a judging panel for a group of young social entrepreneurs in London last night. And uh, you know, there was, uh, they, they, they had ideas in water, sanitation, uh, renewable energy, um, uh, cultivating trade in rural areas in Africa, etc. Like all of these are going to become multi-billion dollar, if not tr multi-trillion dollar industries. Um, enormous growth potential for European companies, but um, you know, the, the truth is that US and European country, uh, companies by and large don't understand those markets, and that's an immersion um, that's going to have to take place, um, together with uh, locals to really understand the kind of consumer needs, because I think that's where there's going to be huge growth. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Oh, hi. Uh, Barbara Fogarty, uh, DCU. Um, we heard earlier about the very significant brain drain that we're experiencing here in Ireland. And I suppose that's particularly evident in the research third level sector. And I would like to ask the panel for their thoughts on um, any examples or ideas they might have on how we could leverage the research and development and innovation capability here in Ireland to greater effect to support this trade and exchange of both people and ideas. And um, we have limited formal mechanisms uh, that we can access to do that at the moment. Connor, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I maybe have an interesting view in this. Um, and I think uh, Kingsley Aikens, anyone knows him, he's got a great phrase and he calls it a walkabout. And uh, I did a walkabout for seven years, and that's where I got nearly all the ideas and experience and networks and connections for, for my company. And I, I luckily, I didn't have to leave Ireland, but 
uh, 21, 22, Ireland was big enough to get enough innovation, get enough ideas. So I think smart young people are going to go abroad, and I think it's very healthy for Irish people to do that. It's unfortunate if they can't come back of their choosing. Um, so I think, like going back to the last point, China, if I was 21 today, I'd be going to China in the morning. Yeah. Um, that is where the excitement, that's where the growth is, that's where, to be honest, as an entrepreneur now, 33, I'm actually worried that I don't know enough about China, and I'd be very panicked in anyone in business that I don't know enough about China, I don't know enough about them culturally, don't know enough about even the layout, the geography, or anything about how doing business there. Um, so learning about China and learning about areas like that and spotting the innovation ideas over there, and then seeing what can you learn there that you can apply back to Ireland. Um, so I think, um, I don't know if that directly answers your question in terms of research and innovation, but people talk about brain drain. I think a lot of, like nearly everyone in my cohort in college probably left, but a lot of them are actually coming back now, and they're coming back with great ideas, or you know, they have an opportunity to come back. And I think if I see that compared to some of my friends who didn't leave Ireland, they're still here, and they kind of have more of an Irish view of the global econ of the economy rather than the fact that, you know, in my view, Ireland is a nice village on the west coast of Europe. I mean, the, the workforce has really changed dramatically over the last five years in terms of, as you say, that mobile workforce in certain industries, in tech, in R&D, in, um, you know, computers and coding, all of that. And, and we nearly expect our young people now to go abroad for a few years and come back. So, um, Erica, did you want to... No, I think the, the, it's a very fascinating question because in, in, in the, the landscape we are operating in um, as an internet company, uh, I mean, we do have 500 people employed here and we will hire more, I think we announced to, to hire about 100 more persons, um, primarily engineers. Um, so they are, of course, not all from Ireland. They come from all over the world because of the, the way innovation cycles work in this industry. Um, you, you, you even find a, you know, a, a particular um, cap capability you're looking for automatically you know, in, in your national or domestic area. Um, but this is a chance, I think, for, because of, for Ireland, because Ireland was always open, it was always international. Um, so it's a very unique chance, particularly for young people, actually, to embrace uh, this development and either go for some years elsewhere, then come back, or stay elsewhere, because the connection will always remain. So the, the hope is that this um, you know, free trade agreement will be, bring prosperity and growth and you know, more employment to our economies in Ireland and elsewhere in Europe and in the United States and ideally globally. Because you know, if you know, Europe comes back on, on, on its feet and um, the United States uh, employment sector functions better and more growth and more jobs are built, then, of course, you, know, you will have an, an, an effect on the global economy as well. That's the idea. And so I'm actually quite hopeful if you really focus and, on innovation, as you say, and understand that many of the business models are pioneering. So we don't design you know, regulatory environments or imagine you know, a free trade agreement which only looks ahead you know, for the next five years. But if it's open-minded, innovation-friendly, uh, if it allows you know new business model to evolve, um, then I think it can actually lead to uh, you know what you think is relevant uh, for Ireland and for all of us. Um, do you think that maybe Irish policymakers should acknowledge and embrace kind of the boomerang workforce and kind of say, well, look, if we just know that our young people are going to go out there in two or three years, we don't necessarily want them to stay there, but we want them to take what they've learned and come back. You know, as a small island, is that maybe something we should say, look, we have a boomerang workforce, that's just the way it's going to be. Yes, we're going to export some of our, you know, highly educated workforce for a few years, but let's do something to bring them back. I mean, is that the, the ideal thing? Both ways. So there's, both there's, ways, yes. Yeah, there's 50% like, of Google's employees here are non-Irish nationals. And um, when that's, that's happening from just a startup and entrepreneur perspective, there's, there's a company, Profiteer, where the founders are from Ukraine and Belarus, and they moved here seven years ago to work with Google. They've now won the Global IBM Entrepreneur of the Year. They've spun out of Google, and they're living here in Dublin because they enjoy living here. Excellent. So it actually works both ways as well. And then the ideas and the culture of these people coming to Dublin, they end up, you know, for me, it's, it's not Ireland, U, US. It's, you know, it's a global economy. I think, and, you know, it's just to make it as easy as possible to do that and make sure you're a place that is identified with innovation and is a good place that people want to actually congregate and that I think government gets out of the way and lets you do that. Okay, I've been told that we need to wrap it up. Yeah. Um, so just finally, does anybody have a final comment on if this agreement happens, what will things look like in five years? I should say when this agreement happens. When it happens, right? And, Let's and get I it think done. That, I think that's a very important mm. point because I think it will be not that difficult to get an agreement. It really, I, I think what I haven't heard from a lot of the people engaged over the last two days is what 
what's the success criteria? You know, what is success for this agreement? Um, you know, you will get, you will, I'm sure, pick off some low-hanging fruit. Uh, but I think we need to start setting some targets for the agreement um, early on and make it ambitious. Uh, and I think you know there is definitely uh, from top down, you know, from President Obama, from the EU, there is a desire to make this agreement work. There is a window of opportunity. We have a, 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 a our interests are aligned right now. Uh, so we absolutely, I think, got to go hammer and tongs uh, using Michael O'Leary's time frame rather than some more <laughs> traditional ones uh, to make it work. Uh, but I, I think you know it, it is policymakers have now embarked on doing this. They want to do it, but it is up to business to feed back up and say, mm -hmm. here's what we need from it to make it actually effective. Um, so that's what I would say. So in five years, it'll be jobs, growth. In five years, it will be a, it will be a trade a, the trade ag uh, agreement that makes um, operating an uh, investment in both uh, continents and both blocks uh, easier than it is today. Removes some of the obvious tariff barriers, the non-tariff barriers, where the regulatory environment is far more consistent and, and, co and coordinated. Um, and I think to all the, the comments made here, that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place where people want to come into uh, with their ideas, with their expertise and work. Great. Thank you very much to, to all our speakers. Um, Peter Keegan, President of the American Chamber of Commerce, Ireland. Erica Mann, Head of Global Policy at Facebook in Europe. Paulo Hara, Director of Ashoka Europe and founder of Change Nation. And Connor Murphy, founder and CEO of Data Hug. And um, I'd just like to welcome back up um, our charge d'affaires to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Hi, I'll be very brief. Um, I need to say a couple of thank yous, um, very, very important. I want to thank uh, Eli, uh, sponsor of the uh, breakfast you've all enjoyed this morning. So thank you very much, uh, Eli. I'd like to thank the panelists, both for the first session and the second. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and your thoughts. I'd also like to thank all the participants here today. You are the new leaders and we very much want to stay in touch. Um, we'd like to do this as often as we can. Uh, my marching orders from Mike Froman at the White House was that this was a great idea, his couple of days here, and we need to keep the momentum on because we do need to get this thing done. So we welcome your thoughts. If you weren't able to ask a question today, please send them in to us. We want to make this a participatory uh, process. Um, lastly, um, just wanted to uh, say thank you to my own team, uh, to everyone at the embassy who put this together today and yesterday. I'm really lucky that I have a fantastic group of people that I work with, so if you don't mind, a round of applause to everyone who helped put this together. <clears throat> and, and finally, to steal another quote, this time from Michael O'Leary, he likes to have an on-time departure. So I think we're just about there. So thank you so much for coming.